Looks like we have some attendees. We will wait until right about 3.30 or 3.31 to get started. We're gonna wait for them to roll in here, but welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. It looks like we have a great group. We're going to wait just a minute or so here to allow some more people to join. All right. We are just at about 3.30 here. It looks like we have some participants still trickling in, but we do wanna be really mindful of your time. So we might give it another 30 seconds and we'll get started in just a second, but welcome, welcome. All right, it looks like we have most of our participants here. Um, I'm so glad all of you could join us today. Thank you for being here. My name is Jocelyn Scudder and I'm the Executive Director of the Park City Summit County Arts Council. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I do wanna give a special thank you to our partners, uh, Utah Department of Heritage and Arts, Utah Division of Arts and Museums, Utah Cultural Alliance, Utah Humanities, Utah Museums Association, and locals are agencies from across the state. Um, and so I am going to go through a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get on with our presenters and speakers for today. Uh, one quick note that uh, we want all of you to be aware of is that uh, the economic impact survey that many of you participated in was updated on Friday. And I think we're going to post that in the chat. Um, for you all to access to see the updated impact survey results. Um, I do also want to make sure that all of you know that closed captioning is available. And so please access that from the bottom of your screen if you'd like to access the closed captioning. Um, thank you to all who have submitted questions and topics for this webinar and call. Um, a couple of other housekeeping items, Utah Humanities and Utah Division of Arts and Museums will be opening their CARES Act funding applications next Monday, May 11th. It's a very exciting announcement. I know many of you who are nonprofit organizations or museums, um, cultural organizations are very pleased with that update. Um, and the Utah Division of Arts and Museums is hosting a conversation regarding grants tomorrow at noon. And if you are interested in that, we highly encourage you to register. Uh, and there's going to be a link posted in the chat for you to register uh, to join in that call again tomorrow at noon. And so really what we're gonna be talking about today, as you know, the state has moved to orange as May 1st, as of May 1st. And if any of you have questions about imp the uh, necessary implementation and guidelines to reopen, um, if you're deciding to stay, stay closed, please let us know. Uh, we are going to, the cultural conversations are gonna be hosted by the Utah Cultural Alliance tomorrow at two, and there will be a chance for people to ask questions and discuss plans for reopening opening. That is free for anyone to attend. Again, we will include information about that in the chat. But today, we will be talking with two organizations that made the very difficult decision not to reopen their seasons this summer. However, before we hear from our colleagues, we are honored to welcome uh, Dr. Joseph Miner, and he is the Executive Director of the Utah Department of Health. And as director, Dr. Miner oversees nearly a thousand health department employees with the goal of helping Utah become the healthiest state in the nation. Prior to his appointment as executive director, Dr. Miner served as the executive director of the Utah County Health Department for 32 years. Dr. Miner holds three degrees, Bachelor of Science from the Brigham Young University, Medical Doctor, and Masters of Science in Public Health, both from the University of Utah School of Medicine. Dr. Miner, we so appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And so uh, we would love if you could take a few minutes to explain what moving to orange means for 
for the cultural spe sector specifically, including museums and arts organizations. Welcome, Dr. Miner. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is a huge issue. It's new to all of us. Um, it's probably new to several generations of people what we're dealing with here. So we're learning as we go along, trying and thinking about many different things to to um, to be as get back to normal as quickly as possible. So to do this. Uh, we have guidelines for reopening the economy and uh, and biz businesses and uh, that includes cultural arts and uh, virtually everything and uh, to to do that we have we're phasing phasing it in high risk is orange we think we qualify to i mean high risk is red we think we qualify to move to orange which is moderate risk uh, to qualify to be moderate risk, you need to see a decrease in new cases. We, we actually are seeing more cases from day to day, but part of that's because we're getting more, we're doing a lot more testing. The actual percent of positive tests, uh, the percent of all the tests that we're getting day to day that are positive is actually going down. So for that sense, we're, where we're seeing a lower percentage. We've never seen the, you know, when Park City first had their huge outbreak, uh, they were the first really hot spot in Utah. 30% of all the tests they were running in the Park City area were positive. But the rest of the state has been 5% or less. Uh, most, most days we're down around 4% or even less of positive tests. So that's kind of a measurement of, of how much community spread is going on. For the most part, most cases that we're seeing um, are from a known contact, a family member or some other close contact they've had with a positive case. So there's, there's less community spread. However, it doesn't take much for some community spread to just explode into huge numbers like we saw in uh, in Park City, and you see in long-term care facilities and some uh, some um, isolated type areas. I mean, you all probably many of you heard about the choir back east of about ninety people that um, had their choir practices and were not social distancing. I don't know how many practices they had, but from one or two practices, they had 60 something members of the choir infected. Anytime you're singing, you're blowing lots of extra uh, virus out into the, into the crowd of singers. You're breathing in deeply, so you're taking in a lot of virus. And boy, that's, that's the way you get a huge explosion suddenly with a, a congregation of people that are talking loudly or singing and all close together, partying or whatever. And, and it can go from, we don't think we have much of a problem to really having a serious disaster. So I know that people say it's gonna be a disaster to have to go back to red, but the reason we're willing to open up to orange now is because we know we have the option of going back to red if things don't go well. And so it's, it's important to have that. Uh, it's not a disaster to go back to red if there's problems, but it really takes everyone understanding and participating to, to keep from going back to red. And, and, um, and cultural arts uh, is an area that is very, very difficult because by nature, it's very social and including lots of people in crowds and um, and that that you just you can't do very easily at, at, at all that I, we, this category includes sporting events of course you've got um, well a lot of cultural events are spectator events people go to watch uh, musical performances and plays and um, 
but also this area actually includes sporting events where you have fans in the stands to watch uh, different types of sporting events as well. And that's where you have the biggest uh, challenge is, is how you're going to keep the spread from, uh, among, among the um, audience or the fans. Uh, obviously, if it's a choir singing, you've got a problem there uh, as, as well that's, that's doing the performance or other performers that are close together. So that's what we're trying to do. And, and the, the, rather than give every little detail of every kind of situation you can possibly imagine, we're trying to refine this, particularly like with youth sports, and, but also with types of cultural events, trying to, um, to give some very basic principles and let people use their creativity and initiative to, to decide how, how it could work. And uh, I'm sure you've already met and thought about this. Um, and there, there are ways. I mean, we saw, see all our national and international performers streaming their performances um, uh, live, uh, like we're doing here over, over whatever um, Zoom or Google Hangouts or uh, Google Meets and so forth. Skype, Facebook. So, I mean, there are a lot of creative things that could be done there as far as how you generate revenues from that to pay for, for what you do is, is more challenging. And, um, but there are creative things that could be done there, I, I believe as well. Uh, this is while we're in the red phase, but a lot of these, again, because congregations with cultural events and uh, spectator uh, and athletic events are, are difficult to maintain the principles that are necessary. Even, if, even when we go to yellow, and I, it may not be too long before we go to yellow if this goes really successfully. Um, I, I'm imagining we'll be on yellow for, for a long time. We're on yellow almost until we have a vaccine available. Uh, and so, hopes of going to green until we have vaccine or a proven effective treatments that will be really quite a while but so that's one thing you could look for is see how it will uh, vary when once we transition over to uh, the yellow uh, category or phase of opening up the economy and, and life as, as we know it. Um, so the most basic principles are stay at least six feet away from others, unless it's a household member. If it's a household member that you are living closely with anyway, they could be seated together, but then you space other households uh, six feet away from anyone in those households, if you're going to have them seated in, in an audience. Um, you sell just uh, every third or fourth, third row or whatever, depending on distances. Uh, there are some things to do there. Um, when one of the biggest issues are, are the pinch points where people are coming through entrances or leaving through exits, and you, you've got people that are crowding together. I personally think everyone ought to have a mask with them. Um, that doesn't seem to, to uh, what would you say, uh, dignified. They have to wear a mask to a high culture event, <laughs> but um, that's, that's an option that, um, you know, I think everyone ought to have some kind of a face cover so that when they're closer to people, which is inevitably gonna happen, uh, going in and out of entrances or even out on the sidewalk, that they, they should have that as well. Face coverings are extremely important, but it requires everyone to have one. The face cover actually protects others better than it protects the persons wearing them, even though the person wearing them is definitely benefits from it as well. 
So, but if both are wearing it, it really does decrease the, uh, the virus that is, is uh, spreading in the air. Um, and um, and uh, from from either either the the person either person that uh, is wearing the mask or any of all the people that are wearing masks. Does that um, does that make sense? Um, so I uh, another thing that is done is uh, you space uh, individuals. You have them enter uh, with a distance between all of the people entering. You have them pay with um, cashless payment uh, or pay in advance or, and have reservations so people can, again, minimize uh, close contact with others. Any, um, any, I know our question and answer is for later. Let me just scan over some of the, the six foot distance, the uh, reserve seating um, and blocking, uh, blocking seats off and reserved, uh, established window time for high risk groups. You know, a lot of uh, retired people who would be high risk just because of age usually, um, or others for other reasons are high risk. They love, cultural arts and it's hugely important uh, thing in their life and if there's a way to accommodate them separately from the the regular crowds is is important if they can be seated earlier and the, um, um, contact uh, contact less payment Uh, oh, uh, for, as far as performers, it, it, it would be important to screen all performers and have backup performers uh, for symptoms, uh, respiratory illness symptoms and fever, just because, again, you don't want someone singing up there that uh, it's a COVID singer and uh, spreading virus to many, many people all at once. Um, Electronic tickets and playbills are encouraged. Concessions would follow normal uh, restaurant type restrictions where you have six foot distance. Again, face covers, um, contactless payment. Uh, it's better to have uh, grab and go food rather than uh, sit down uh, dining anywhere even though we are allowing sit down dining under very uh, restricted uh, um, conditions. Um. So Dr. Miner, I think this is maybe a perfect time. I know we are going to encourage everyone on the call to utilize the Q&A feature. If they have any specific questions about the most recent health order and maybe how it kind of, uh, is specific to their organization. I know I am incredibly grateful to have you on this call, and I know many on this uh, call are probably feeling the same, to just have someone help us really untangle what this next phase means and what these health precautions mean. Um, of course, we are all very eager to jumpstart our programming again, but uh, public health is paramount. And so um, I do wanna remind everyone that um, while we have a couple more speakers to get through, we are going to do a Q&A session at the end of this call uh, and Dr. Miner is going to stay with us. Yes, Dr. Miner? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for yeah. giving us that synopsis and we'll keep you on for specific questions in a little bit, okay? Great, thanks. Wonderful. Well, thanks again. And um, so we are going to move on to our uh, colleagues, to our speakers who have joined us today. And I am honored to introduce Michael Ballum. He is the founding general director of Utah Festival Opera and Musical Theater in Logan, Utah. And he founded the festival in 1993 and is a professor of music at Utah State University and a, an accomplished opera, um, operatic singer, pianist, and oboist. 
and he is going to talk to us a little bit about how he had to make a very difficult decision this year and cancel his 2020 season. And so again, we will, we will invite Michael to join and thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jocelyn. Uh, yes, it was a terribly difficult decision. Um, however, the choice was very simple. Uh, we care more about people than anything else. And this is an issue of people. Um, I suspect the largest decision I've had in our 28 years happened in our second year, uh, trying to decide whether or not to have a second year after I had discovered how much work it was. Well, as you can see, I've every year said, well, it's, let's try it one more year. Uh, our challenge is, and I, I worked with the governor's office regularly before we made the decision, uh, but I also had our health department. Uh, I spoke to them daily. I had them come over to the Ellen Eccles Theater, which is a 1400 seat auditorium. And in order to get six feet between every patron, we could seat approximately 69 people. Uh, when you're putting on a grand opera that has 300 people involved, uh, playing to 69 people uh, would be a stretch. There were, I tried to the very end to be optimistic that we could play. Uh, um, we did not announce as most of our summer festival opera companies did uh, in March, we held out until it was essential to start bringing the 300 people to Logan. And in order to put them in a situation where they could be quarantined for two weeks, we really needed them last Wednesday. And that is when we made the decision that uh, it was just not feasible for us to do, do it. Our artists come from very compromised areas in the United States. The majority come from New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, Hollywood. Uh, and to bring them all together and begin rehearsals would not be advisable. And so we looked into private housing that we could distance people at least for two weeks to make sure they're not carrying the virus. And that became, there's not that many uh, private apartments in Logan. Uh, there are empty hotels. Before we made the decision, we were visited by the hotels and restaurants of Cache County. They were very worried that we might cancel. We bring nearly 30,000 people to Logan. That, that rivals the population of Logan City. And uh, those hotels survive as they do in Cedar City because of the summer. And the restaurants as well, especially the high-end restaurants, do well in the summer so that they can survive the rest of the year. They were very nervous, and I tried everything in my power to keep everything going, but it just became a matter of putting people in harm's way. And after all, that's what we do in the arts, not put people in harm's way, but we care about people and an experience. It's not a problem product that can sit on the shelf and when this all uh, works its way out we can't sell that, that product the product is an experience and so it became a very difficult decision uh, because the cancellation of a summer season is a very costly one uh, we'll figure all of that out as time goes on but it became necessary to make the decision that in order to protect our artists the 300 of them and the 20 30 thousand people who come to Logan needing to protect them. So it really became an easy choice. The choice was we, we care more about people than anything else. The decision was hard, nevertheless. I'd be happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, Michael. And I know I, I hear it in your voice. Many of us are trying to figure out what to do with our programming. And I know it was an incredibly difficult decision. Uh, but I think making that difficult decision to cancel your 2020 season showcases a lot of organizational strength and leadership. And um, I think that many of your patrons will appreciate that you did 
prioritize public health. Um, I know a lot of us are trying to figure out creative problem solving ways to potentially host programming. Um, you know, there's a lot of innovation taking place, but sometimes you're just at a halt and you need to do what you have to do. So we really appreciate your story, sharing uh, your decision making, and um, we will save some uh, questions for the end because we do have one more uh, speaker to join us to also talk about their process and their decision making and deciding what they should do for the 2020 season. So thank you, Michael, for being here. And um, again, he will stay on the call with us. So if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A feature. And so finally, our last speaker, I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce Michelle McDonald, who is the Director of Operations and Vendor Logistics for Park Silly Sunday Market. And so um, she's, she's a park Park City person, um, as uh, you know, we are the Park City Summit County Arts Council. So I'm thrilled to have one of our own talk about uh, our beloved Park City Sunday Market uh, and about how she had to come, her, her and her team had to come to a very difficult decision to cancel their season. Michelle manages, also manages the Summit County Fair and has a bachelor's degree from the State University of New York College at Potsdam. And so Michelle, I will have you come in now and I think she's just gonna join us on a call to discuss their process um, in deciding to cancel Park Silly Market. So welcome, <laughs> Michelle. Thank you, Jocelyn. And uh, I apologize to not have video available to everybody right now. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that decision, I mean, Michael said exactly what we said as we made the decision. It ultimately comes down to the people in our community and the concern for the general health. Our event for 14 Sundays in summer on a typical year would have 15,000 visitors on a single Sunday in a small area of Main Street that also is a uh, Quite frankly, it's impossible to really control access to that area because um, it's not just limited to attendees of our events. There are residents that access that area, um, other businesses operating independently of our event. Um, so we also tried to remain very optimistic for a long time, even um, two weeks before we made the decision we had done an interview that we were keeping the faith and maybe optimistic that we might just have a delayed start possibly in july um also in that time meeting regularly with our county manager our county health officials um, park city municipal uh, staff and you know I think the, the hardest thing is that nobody can be sure of what the next step is or when we'll get there. Um, so even as we were trying to hold off with that delayed start, that gets tricky for Park Silly Sunday Market. We're, as you all are, nonprofit and we're heavily sponsor based. It's, it's um, not a good feeling to accept a sponsorship and not be certain what kind of ROI that partner can get, uh, especially with some of our long-term that have a very high expectation. <laughs> um, so those things get difficult. You don't want to accept, especially cash, you don't want to accept that kind of sponsorship level uh, and think you might not meet standards and how are you going to be able to give it back? The expenses are still the same. Um, and then again, talking to the city actually asked us at one point to, you know, how creative can you guys get? But again, I don't know how to not let people in and how how we would manage social distancing in our venue uh i don't know we put a six foot tutu on everybody so that they can't cram together 
is our silly idea, but we know that that's not going to work. <laughs> um, so it really came down to just having the best interest of our community. And when I say community, I mean, you know, all not just Park City. A lot of our small businesses and artists come out of the valley. A third of our 15,000 people per Sunday come from all over Utah. A um, third of them travel from out of the state to visit. It, it, it was the hardest discussions we've ever had um, daily for about three weeks. Uh, our executive director and I, Kate, would be on the phone every single day um, debating the decision. But the minute we made it, it was easy, which <laughs> it's, I, I don't know, I'm still kind of speechless. I get choked up about it um, because it is such a community draw. But as soon as we did it, we knew it was right. And we're, our position now is to help whatever other events in our community are able to come up with uh, some kind of creative way to have their event. We are in support mode for all those people. Um, we're happy to help them in the process. We're happy to help them execute if we can. And we're going to watch and learn and uh, see what kind of adjustments we're going to need for 2021 and just make sure we're in a great spot um, to launch next June based on whatever happens between now and then. Um, and I, I'll, well, one other thing I will say, Summit County Fair, because we're on that one too, we're still waiting there as well. And we're in the creative phase with that event. Can we still hold a demolition derby and possibly have spectators watch it drive in movie style? I don't know. We're in the brainstorming process for that, but we have that's not till August, so we have a little bit of time, but we'll see. It's going to be a tricky year. And that's all I have. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for sharing. Um, it does, it makes my heart hurt personally as a Park City resident to know that uh, Park City Sunday Market will not be happening this summer. And I think everyone on the call is experiencing that, that pain point. We're all this summer and the next uh, undetermined amount of months is going to look so different, uh, but we really appreciate you sharing your story. And um, I also love that you are, you are stepping into this resource capacity to help others brainstorm who might have a little bit more leeway and time to make the decision of whether or not to cancel their festival or event. Um, but I know group gathering is a very touchy subject right now. And so, um, we are going to move to, so thank you, Michelle, first of all, you're amazing. We love you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, we're gonna move to Q&A. So if anyone who has joined the call has questions for any of our speakers, so for Michael, for Michelle, or for Dr. Miner, please put it in the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to get to all of the questions. I do have a question for Dr. Miner. And um, the question is how many people can congregate when things are, code yellow so it seems like the next phase code uh code yellow is um well originally you know it was uh limited to 10 people under red 20 people under um moderate risk and 50 people under yellow but that's that's in a s smaller area Obviously, if you have a whole arena um, or stadium, you have you can accommodate very well a whole lot more people than uh, twenty or fifty people. So, so the, it, it really is much more uh, an issue of how can you space people out over a much larger area rather than just limit to the to the 20 or under red or 50 under yellow. <clears throat> That's, um, it, it was assuming that those 20 or 50 would be in a 
in an assembly room of some type and that you would uh, limit the numbers uh, and spacing uh, to those numbers because of that, that limited space. Uh, masks have not been uh, discussed as much and masks are a huge benefit. Uh, you, you know, the mass benefits the wearer more than the user or benefits someone else more than the person that's using the mask. But if everyone wore a mask and were required, it would, it would allow uh, people to be a lot, lot safer. Um, but that was, that's, that's the numbers. Uh, Dr. Ballum, uh, his point of, um, we're, we first of all care about people and especially people who enjoy the cultural arts, who have time and resources to do a lot of that, frequently are high risk, uh, high risk individuals and they're particularly uh, high risk of serious fatal complications. And I, the, the term social distancing, I'll go on record as saying again, I've said it several times, social distancing is a term I do not like. You hear it all the time because that sounds um, antisocial. I'm all for physical distancing, but socially connecting and there are ways to, that's what cultural arts does is help people socially, socially connect. And, uh, and if there are ways to do that, we, we absolutely, and we're doing it right now with virtual meetings like this all the time. So if there are ways to do it virtually, any things and, and actually create revenues from that, uh, that that's always a good I idea to help people perform and, um, and be able to see the performances and yet, um, and yet not in uh, danger people. Thank you so much, Dr. Miner. And I think that's exactly right. I love what you said about us physically distancing, but socially connecting, because I think many people on this call will agree that art does connect us. And that's why we want to figure out and um, how we could maybe have some programming this summer and to, to continue to connect our communities. So thanks so much for those insights. Uh, my Our next question here is for Michael. Uh, and we have someone asking how your board was involved in that decision. So wondering if you can talk a little bit about that process and how you involved your board to talk uh, to make that decision for your 2020 season. Okay, well, that's a very important question uh, for a not-for-profit. I, I can't get my video started. It doesn't that's seem to right. me. You can, just, you can just talk to us. That's okay, just well, you're all spared having to look at me. Board of directors are very important in not-for-profits, and they certainly need to be part of the decision-making process. In our case, we have we have 25 full-time year-round employees and then 300 uh, seasonal employees. And we could see with each passing day more and more concern from members of the, the artists who would be coming in. And our staff became more and more concerned. We made the statement early on that we were going to move forward as planned. And that was uh, sanctioned by the board and felt good about it. And with each step that it became more and more clear that that was not going to be as we had hoped, the board was kept apprised of that. And ultimately the board has to support what the staff determines. And we had complete support when the decision was made uh, to forego the season. There, was, there were concerns because we have a four and a half million dollar budget 45% of which come from ticket sales. And that is a large concern. And since the fiduciary responsibility is with the board of directors, that was a concern. How do we accommodate for that? Well, we can't. So they took a leap of faith with us that somehow it will all work out with the premise that we really have to take care of our people and people are more important than things. 
Well, thank you, Michael. I know many people on this call uh, work with nonprofits and all boards are different and we all work with them very closely. And so it's, um, it's really helpful to hear your process in involving the board in this decision because I know that'll be a process for many who are on this call. Uh, and so one thing I did wanna mention that I think I overlooked uh, in the chat uh, you will see there is actually a link um, for information about masks. And we did want to mention and just remind uh, all pan or all people participating in this call that Utahns um, can receive receive a free mask by going to the link that we provided in um, in the chat. It's coronavirus.utah.gov slash mask. Uh, so again, that's in the chat feature if you want to look that up and find more information about that resource, which is pretty incredible. And um, we do have another question really for either uh, Michelle or Michael. And uh, the question is, how have you communicated your plans to your audience? What have responses or what responses have you received? Uh, so either of you feel free to jump in. We've um, had nothing I, I, but positive. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yeah. We've had nothing but positive response from it. Uh, it's been heartwarming because we knew there would be a lot of disappointment, but by and large, it has been our supporters, both who buy tickets and those who make donations, felt that uh, we were to be congratulated for making such a tough call and determining that the safety of people was preeminent. I, I agree. We've had very much the same experience overall. Um, the response is very supportive. We did start our communications with our, our partners first, our very first, before we were putting out our press release on on a Wednesday, on Monday and Tuesday before that was reaching out to all our 600 artists who were on deck for the summer to let them know what was coming, our own, our sponsorship partners, um, the, the Park City Municipal staff that we work with, we needed to keep them in the loop with council, uh, our staff, our volunteers, so the days before that was a lot of outreach to um, our, our family, basically, uh, that help us put on the event and then press release and social media. And again, overall, very supportive. You know, there's always going to be somebody who thinks we're talking doomsday when we shouldn't, but overall, very supportive. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions. And I know both of your organizations are uh, highly respected in both of your communities. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that while many are disappointed to hear the results of your decision, they respect it and um, probably can't wait till 2021 or the next time that you can host an event. Um, so thank you again. And um, I think we are, we're nearing the end of our call, but we do have the Q&A section open if there are any more questions. So um, if you have any immediate questions, we'll ask you to put that in the chat right now. Uh, and we'll, I'll just give everybody a moment to, to respond to that. Um, but if there are no other questions, we will be mindful of your time. And I think we had till uh, 4.15 to, uh, to have this call. So it looks like we're right on schedule. Dr. Miner, did you have something to add as a final remark? I was, I was going to comment, out, outdoors is definitely easier than indoors because you usually will have a lot larger space to work with. Even then, obviously you have to manage crowds and numbers and limit limit numbers so that they can stay reasonably apart. But but the natural breezes of outdoors helps disperse and um, not and disperse the fog that people create when they're breathing and talking and just being there that others are walking through. But that that obviously helps with with a lot of with some cultural events that are outdoors. 
Perfect. Well, thank you for reiter reiterating that. Um, and we appreciate those insights. Uh, and again, I can't tell you how um, it, it provides me a lot of relief to have someone who is working through that lens of public health, just to kind of walk us through some of these guidelines as we are making decisions. Um, so one more reminder before we hop off. Um, we did want to just remind everybody that uh, cultural conversations are hosted by Utah Cultural Alliance and uh, that'll be tomorrow at two. And so uh, during that call, anyone participating will have a chance um, to ask questions and discuss plans for reopening. And again, it's free for anyone to attend. There is a link in the chat to join and register for that call. So we encourage you if you, if you wanna continue this conversation, that is a wonderful platform to do so. And so I think with that, we want to thank you for joining us. We will see you soon. Be well, and thanks again for being with us. Thank you.